history begins with a Muhammad bin Qasim and comes till today. So the new generation is full of hatred for Hindus. Now here the same process has been duplicated. You delete Mughals. You say Aryans are the original inhabited of this land, which is against the scientific studies which have come up. We the Hindus have been here from times immemorial. We have been a Hindu nation from times immemorial. So Hindus have a primary right. And this actually Sihala Buddhist did in Sri Lanka. Path they followed, the past path covered disaster which they followed. Now we are following with full speed, changing history books, removing Mughals from that, removing the chapter on Mahatma Gandhi's murder. Mahatma Gandhi's India, hello, Mahatma Gandhi's India. The way he did for Hindu Muslim unity, fraternity, and if you remove that part, now the part, you know, yesterday itself uh, I completed one article, they removed that sentence that uh, RSS was banned because RSS spread hatred. Nathuram Godse was member of Hindu Mahasabha. But we also know that the type of hatred which RSS spread, it is because of that hatred that the murder of Mahatma Gandhi took place. So he did not see who pulled the trigger. Patel did not see who pulled the trigger. He saw the process. And, and this divisive ideology people, they are much more united. And through their machinations, they have got hold of the money. They have trained the manpower. So today, I think what is needed is that we connect to the community and communicate to them what was really freedom movement. What did Gandhi stand for? What did Ambedkar stand for? What did Bhagat Singh stand for? This is the big challenge which the social groups have to face. Democracy should be a journey from formal equality to substantive equality. Hello. Uh, today, we have a very eminent guest for our program, Cotton, and he is none but Dr. Ram Puniani. And uh, we welcome you to this uh, program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and first, actually, Ram Puniani is a human rights activist. He's an author of many books. And for me, he is a great educator. So uh, first, I would like to ask you, the, to you, what is, what is the, there is a lot of discussion these days on idea of India. So how do you like to discuss, how do you like to define the idea of India? Yeah, I think that's a very core question for our present political scenario. Because the idea of India, which developed through the freedom movement, is being challenged. Actually, the idea of India, which began with uh, during colonial period, with the social and political changes. What were the social changes? What were the political changes? What are the economic changes? Let's understand. Like economically, we see the introduction of railways, transport, communication, modern education, modern judiciary, education for Dalits, education for women. Now, it is from this that elementary groups conceptualizing India came up. Now, when these groups were coming up, actually it is from these groups which culminated in the formation of Indian National Congress in 1885. Now, on the other side, when this whole idea of India was developing in an elementary form, this was also in an elementary form, but this was shaking the societal structure based on feudal values. Like there is a feudal lord, there is a Raja, Nawab, Jamidar, Jagirdar, and affiliated clergy. Now, when these changes started taking place, these old ruling classes felt that their power is going. So they threw up another idea of the country. I will not say India, they because they did not use the word India. Because from the rising classes came up people like uh, revolutionaries like Bhagat Singh and his associates who conceptualized India, Naujawan Bharat Sabha. There was Bhim Rao Baba Sahib Ambedkar types who conceptualized against secular democratic India and the whole national mo movement led by Mahatma Gandhi that was conceptualizing this India. 
and these three tendencies culminated in indian constitution and surendra panerjee's book describes it brilliantly when he says india nation in the making so this is the idea of india which culminated in freedom movement now but there are other people who were not agreeing with this so they threw up muslim nationalism muslim uh, politics hindu politics muslim nationalism uh, again in the form of muslim league hindu nationalism in the form of hindu mahasabha and rss so the idea these people muslim uh, communalists and hindu communalists they did not conceptualize secular democratic india they talked of a muslim state they talked of a hindu state and so this is where basically we have to distinguish between the idea of india which is represented in constitution which in, emerges in from the freedom movement in the preamble of the constitution in in the preamble of the constitution the the idea of india expounded by you that was very succinctly put in the preamble of the constitution absolutely absolutely and you also when you say that okay uh, the muslim fundamentalist and the hindu fundamentalist they oppose this that means when on the one hand the idea of india was growing that is was uh, uh, honored in the in the form of the constitution of india and at that time itself it also faced the challenge absolutely very good very correct so now, there were people who were opposed to it opposed to it now now that after 75 years of our independence yeah. now how this idea of india how do you see that how this idea of india is challenged at the yeah. at the moment how is it is how is it how is it challenged at the moment actually till 1980s or 1990 this idea of india was a dominating discourse in the country and from 1980s you know when the rath yatra started rath yatras for ram temple of course the background was shah banu case which also gave stimulus to these people so when these rath yatra started they started talking of hindu rashtra so in contrast to the secular democratic india from 1990s we see the politics in the name of religion under the garb of religion on the issues which are divisive which are emotive we divide the society they started challenging this idea of india so this was a major challenge and a minor challenge to this also came from muslim fundamentalists who because of various reasons because major muslim fundamentalists went to pakistan wanted to make a country in the name of islam but that experiment also failed and they divided into two your neighbor bangladesh and pakistan and here from 1990s this hindu nationalist politics started becoming dominant and this started becoming dominant because of several factors but the main factor was a well trained army of pracharaks and swayamsevaks who were being trained from last 60 years 70 years incessantly and the secondly raising up the issue of emotions because emotions really divide the politics while the social issues unite the country so this basic difference let's see the issues which bhagat singh was talking the issues which ambedkar was talking issues which gandhi took up it united the country and the issues which the communal politics takes it divides the society one versus the other my temple versus your mosque my holy book versus your holy book then love jihad cow and all that of course you are in north east so you know beef is no problem but all over the country what we call as cow belt cow dominated the politics hundreds of people died that was against the idea of india which was nurtured by freedom movement okay now uh, one thing i just want to come here that uh, the political mechanization now how this 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 uh, idea of india is challenged by from a fundamentalist point of view now uh, many people say that okay this uh, there is political mechanization but if 
there is no support among the people among people if there is no considerable support of this divisive politics this communal ideas then how could they actually uh, only through mechanization political mechanization they could gain the support of so many people or they could actually uh, do all kinds of uh, divisive politics yeah that's a very good question and very tough one also because by 1980 a section of society started feeling the threat from the rising dalit politics rising representation of dalits in jobs education they also started feeling threatened or uh, what is called existential anxiety especially the rich peasant the affluent upper caste of the city and small industrialist they are the classical middle class they started feeling that okay now we cannot become the rich and the elite of that order but the poor people who are coming they are trying to compete with us i'll give you one or two example so the first major assault of this took place in the form of anti dalit violence because dalits were getting some affirmative action reservation even that was not acceptable acceptable to them so they started anti dalit violence in 1980s in ahmedabad then anti obc violence in 1985 and then after mandal commission you see that this divisive politics got the support base from those caste and classes which we are not comfortable with the journey towards social equality and that is the core foundation earlier they used to say brahmin baniya now the new classes which i will say uh, it class or this sections of middle class which have a sort of anxiety about their jobs about their educational uh, privileges and etc which they felt the loss of this so it is from this social classes that the core support of this divisive politics comes and the other support then you know there is a basic support then they are able to mobilize the others the cleverness is this politics if, if, if i could just uh, uh, i interfere a little bit you said that this is the basic economic this is the major economic factor yeah, this is the yeah. major economic factor and i i hope you are going to explain the other things cultural and religious factors too yeah see so question is this is the core support for this type of a group which we saw in the post mandal post mandal strengthening of rath yatras see we saw the strengthening of communal party in the post mandal period i hope you recognize that yes, yes, same yes. part which had very two mps in 1984 it, it, it became actually yeah it uh, and after babri demolition it uh, escalated so this is the core and it is trying to mobilize it gets mobilized other sectors of society like unemployed youth unemployed youth and the other sections of rural and urban population which are rootless in a way so they are given the identity that okay your religion is under threat your religion is under threat and we are here to protect your religion so that's where so core support and the incidental large layer of support comes to this particular uh, uh, politics which makes them stronger so that means there is one is the economic component and another is the identity politics okay. and both the things are actually put together and presented in a very nicer way nicer within code yeah. in a very divisive way and yeah. so that they could actually mobilize a large section of the people in their favor now a uh, thing is that when you have you have very nicely very nicely and if we could see the history of india of last few decades then we could actually we could relate what you said how actually after the mandal politics how after the mandal thing actually how the bjp could actually mobilize itself and how its number was growing how a major section of the uh, upper caste actually aligning with it and also some other people now given the circumstances at the moment 
how could we promote the idea of india and how yeah. could we fight against this divisive politics yeah. what is your take that's a million rupee question because dollar is anyway very expensive <laughs> so so the question is as such you know that at the ground level people are suffering the pangs of poverty people's feet are having also having erosions because of the covid migration people are also feeling the pinch of demonetization which made millions of the people unemployed at the moment the economic plight of the country is abysmal abysmal i don't go by gdp and how rich ambani and adani have become for me the index of the rich social societal economic is a poor person in the slum a poor person in the village how they are living and those conditions are degenerating prices are rising prices are rising and our overall security for dalits women adivasi is declining so there is a very big uh, section of society which can oppose this politics of sectarianism the question is that the sectarian politics which is the, which is basically guided by rss it has created a large man power thousands of pracharaks lakhs of swayam sevak number 1 number 2 their policies are such that rich corporate is on their favor because they abolished the rights of workers they abolished the they have uh, their uh, policies are leading to the deprivation of peasants so big corporates with them with this they have bought a large section of media what you what in north indian or other language they call godi media which is sitting in the lap of corporate com uh, corporate com communal combine so this is their strength man power muscle power money power emotional power and in contrast to this the opposition which can become secular and concerned about people genuine problem at the moment is very fragmented at least so far till a month ago very fragmented there are regional parties every leader of the regional party wants to become the prime minister okay and the congress was defamed through anna movement which was supported by rss and again rahul gandhi's image was deliberately downgraded so but now situation is changing in two forms two forms now opposition parties i think and i hope are realizing let's hang together otherwise we'll be hang separately number one has it has it come have they realized that have they realized that do you think they have realized partly partly, partly it is optimism partly it is visible also if you see the efforts of some chief ministers meeting others okay let's talk you be in your area i in, in my area and let's have one candidate against the you know bjp rss candidate actually bjp is just a political wing of rss so that sentiment i see mildly developing secondly there are uh, many social, social groups and i as a editor i think you should try to uh, find out in karnataka the social groups have come together for glory of karnataka and irrespective of their differences they are distributing pamphlets they are going to the communities they are trying to tell the people yeah, that that, that, here, here here i just want to uh, make one point that means okay on the one hand the political combination the political parties but as yeah. i myself and you as a citizen the 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 citizens who uh, appreciate or who want wish to promote the idea of india the secular idea of india the idea of india which is actually expounded which is uh, uh, there in the preamble of the cons- uh, of the constitution so what do you think what is their role to protect this idea of india exactly now people like you and me now this non political we do not belong to any political parties hmm. non non electoral people yeah. they are political you yes, are also yes, political yes. you are also political but our politics is the politics of idea of india politics of indian constitution so those groups have come together in karnataka and they are trying to campaign that 
our values don't relate to temple and mosque, cow and blow jihad, etc., etc. Let's come back to the issue of unemployment, poverty, eradication, education, and health. And similarly, at national level, there are efforts, uh, Bharat Jodo Abhiyan, that is one. And there are similar groups which are trying to, you know what has happened? That in progressive groups, there is a fragmentation. There are two people and there are three groups. <laughs> you, you understand? So now that has to be undone. So I may have some differences with you on some points, but that doesn't mean that my politics is separate. So far as we agree on Indian constitution, we can work together. So that spirit is developing and probably as an optimist, I am seeing more into it. Maybe that you can fault me for that. <laughs> you are saying that as an optimist, you are seeing more of it happening. Yeah, as a yeah, yeah. Okay, now, <laughs> again, uh, coming to another thing. Now, see, we have also seen that this government, uh, they're actually, they're going to change the textbooks. They are going to change the textbooks. They are working on that. They have already sensed. And they are in the process of rewriting history. I have two questions here. First thing, the past, can we actually remake past? Can we, we can, we can understand past, we can reconstruct past for understanding. But can we remake past? Now See, this this process of rewriting history, how how would you like to actually elaborate on that? How would you like to uh, respond to that? Yeah. Let me answer this. See, every type of nationalism constructs its own history, and events may be the same. Interpretations are different, and the, as soon as you know, when the NDA government came into power with uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, first thing they did was saffronization of education, introduction of blind faith, introduction of abolition of scientific uh, inquiry. And, and in history, they try to see glorious Hindu kings versus aggressive Muslim kings. So they tried and that same process is going further. Now to give you a simple example, now they did the same thing in Pakistan. In Pakistan, what they did from their textbooks they removed the portion of Hindus. So the history begins with Muhammad bin Qasim and comes till today. So the new generation is full of hatred for Hindus. Now here the same process has been duplicated. You delete Mughals. You say Aryans are the original inhabited of this land, which is against the scientific studies which have come up. So this is that first comer syndrome. First comer syndrome. We the Hindus have been here from times immemorial. We have been a Hindu nation from times immemorial. So Hindus have a primary right. And this actually Sinhala Buddhist did in Sri Lanka. What I'm trying to, why I'm trying to compare, actually we were much better off than our neighbors. But what is happening? The path they followed, the past path towards disaster which they followed, now we are following with full speed, changing history books, removing Mughals from that, removing the chapter on Mahatma Gandhi's murder. Mahatma Gandhi is India. Hello, Mahatma Gandhi is India. The way he did for Hindu-Muslim unity, fraternity, and if you remove that part, now the part, you know, yesterday itself, uh, I completed one article. They removed that sentence that uh, RSS was banned because RSS spread hatred. Nathuram Godse at that time was not a member of RSS, but he got a training in RSS, and that time Sardar Patel made a beautiful point, last point. Made a very beautiful point. He said, RSS is, is being, we know that Nathuram Godse was a member of Hindu Mahasabha, but we also know that the type of hatred which RSS spread, it is because of that hatred that the murder of Mahatma Gandhi took place. So he did not see who pulled the trigger. Patel did not see who pulled the trigger. He saw the process, and that process is being intensified through the change in these textbooks. So now, question is, when they are actually in the textbook, they are removing it. But then we know uh, the one who have read India's history, they know 
what was there and what happened there. Now, how how do we actually educate our young people when when they go to school and they will be reading this actually erroneous, this actually uh, lopsided history? Now, how outside textbook, out outside the school, how do we educate them with the proper actually historical insight, uh, facts, and uh, things of uh, proper sense of history? See, one thing is that the network, which is of the NCRT and the government-aided schools, cannot be substituted. Let me be very honest. We, people like you and me, can make some effort, like through videos, through other things. There are there are various good YouTube channels on history. Like, I can mention some of the names, like uh, when you, Ashok Kumar. You, know, you yourself have done some actually yeah, fantastic yeah, things yeah, but, uh, so thanks. far this, uh, educating people on yeah. history. Right. Yeah, similarly, Ashok Kumar Pandey is doing on the different aspects of history. So these are there, but their reach is very limited. Our reach, my video gets a viewership of 5 lakhs. But my friend, what is 5 lakhs in the country of 130 crores? So question is, your and my efforts need to be jacked up by collaboration with other friends. We need to intensify this, try to reach as much as possible. And secondly, of course, change of government is very important. Let me tell you, because politics is the always in the driver's seat. So, and at that time, if we are successful in changing the government, he means the people of India, then the real struggle begins to reconstruct the idea of India from grassroots levels. Because if people think that uh, we have defeated communal forces in the election, our job is over, I will say, then we are really being defeated despite victory. Your victory will come only when you can combat this negative ideas, divisive ideas, communal ideas from grassroots to universities up in the social consciousness. That remains a very big challenge. It becomes very difficult to actually continue an interview with you because when I go on listening to you, I forget to <laughs> formulate my next question. Now, <laughs> one, <Sorry>. one, <laughs> one thing actually I want to ask you is that, say India is a vast country. It's a very vast country. And okay, when the people who believe in Hindu politics, uh, they have got the majority, but still, if we discuss, if we see their votes there, still they have not got the vote of the majority of the people. So yeah. what what does that indicate? That means so far the so far the people of the country are concerned. Now, what the majority of the people, what do they, how politically we can mobilize a political mobilization, vote politics, electoral politics, that is one thing. But if we go to the composite nature of our society and the people, what, how, what, how, what, what, what does it actually reflect? Yeah, see, actually, honestly, this is again a very crucial point. Uh, I do feel that even today in India, those people who stick to this constitution's idea of India, they are more in number, but they are divided. And this divisive ideology people, they are much more united. And through their machinations, they have got hold of the money, they have trained the manpower. So today I think what is needed is that we connect to the community and communicate to them what was really freedom movement, what did Gandhi stand for, what did Ambedkar stand for, what did Bhagat Singh stand for. This is the big challenge which the social groups have to face. Electoral polit parties will do their job because they have calculations of winning and losing. That's a power point. Like, there is a power point. And, and we are basically concerned with the societal thinking. Society. Society, society, society thinking. So that's we have to focus a bit more. Now I want to ask you, we are just coming almost towards the end of the this uh, discussion. 
Now, yesterday, so not yesterday, day before yesterday, whenever actually you had this interview with Sujit Nair, you there you made a comment. You said that okay, I earlier my understanding of Gandhi was different. I did maybe, and now I have understood actually what Gandhi stood for. Now, what was that? What was the difference of understanding? Yeah, a different was understanding was this that initially. Uh, we did not, at least I did not give so much importance to Gandhi as a nation builder. And we thought anyway, he has uh, achieved the freedom movement, but he was soft on this, he was soft on that. He thought of a uh, sort of a Majur Mahajan, because I was very concerned about workers' rights, Majur Mahajan type union. So that's where we felt that his ideas are not as strong as they should be for social change. And that's why I never gave importance to uh, Gandhi initially. But after 92, I realized that unless we have people like Gandhi, our democracy, like ideas of Gandhi, our democracy cannot sustain. Without democracy, social change cannot take place. Without, for social change, we need social movements. Then I started going into the depth of Gandhi, Ambedkar, and then I realized, well, these are the ideas which a secular democratic nation be, standing on which social movements then can struggle for substantive equality of all sections of society. My concern is that the equality which is there in the constitution, it's a formal equality. It's a formal equality. Democracy should be a journey from formal equality to substantive equality. So first stage, Gandhi, Ambedkar, Bhagat Singh, are absolutely the foundation on which social movements can stand and struggle for the real equality and benefit of all sections of society. I concede that, of course, earlier, before 92, my whole uh, goal was much different. That I was trying to work more for workers' rights, but now I feel nobody's rights are safe if communalism dominates. Yes. Now, I have another question, actually, which is to some extent, I think, related to your question and uh, what we see in Indian reality now. Now, okay, a uh, large section of people, they are still believers. They believe. They have, they, they, they are religious people in India. Some of them, they believe in, say, Hinduism, in different sects of Hinduism. So, or maybe by and large Hinduism. So they are religious people, they are believer, believers. And there are other people who believe in other religions. Now, when we discuss secularism, secularism, now the Western idea of secularism. And in India, if I could say the Gandhi's approach to secularism. So how do you respond to these things? That, okay, I am a Gandhi was a believer. Gandhi was, he was a, he believed in Hinduism. But at the same time, he said that he, he, will, he will protect the people of other religion as such. Excellent. So how do you, now, because now the thing is that, okay, many people are saying that, okay, this religion, religious ideas, they are spreading these divisive things. But a maximum people, a large number of people, they believe in religion. But do they also, they do not believe in communalism. They, 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 they believe in their religion. That does not mean that they hate other people. So, and through Gandhi, what we can learn from for, for this? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's a very question on which a lot of debates have taken place. <clears throat> I see the difference like this. <clears throat> the Western concept of secularism is for a secularized society. What I mean by secularized means where the hold of clergy and the landlord has been abolished. So that the iron curtain between state and religion, they can practice. Now in India, Gandhi is secularism. Maulana Azad is secularism. Why? Because in our society, the process of secularization did not complete. The hold of landlords, the hold of clergy remain. And we have to go from that point of view. We cannot dream that, okay, all feudal ideas are thrown into the dustbin. We cannot, we cannot make a jump. We cannot make a jump. 
Correct, correct. So Gandhi is my secularism. Maulana Azad is my secularism. Where <clears throat> I may, I am, I am following my own religion. But in the matters of state, I respect other religious people as much as I respect my own religion. This is what Gandhi is. This is what Maulana Azad is. So this is where Indian secularism has to follow that path. Till, till of course, we can go to a society where people like Bhagat Singh, their ideas, their criticism of religion is taken up by society. It cannot be imposed. That is the first thing. The religiosity cannot be wiped out by any impositions. It has to emerge from the that, society. That, 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 that is a very important thing. And particularly when a large section of people, they are, they believe in this or that religion. I think this Gandhi's uh, thinking on really uh, uh, the secularism, I think at this moment we should also look at uh, the problem from that Gandhi's point of view, and that is maybe that is the better way to actually uh, tackle the present situation of hatred. Very, very correct. Actually, see, Gandhi finally said, if one can summarize Gandhi's life in dedicating himself to Hindu Muslim unity. That were the two major things. And he did not participate in the celebration of freedom because he was more concerned about the violence and the killing of innocent Hindus and Muslims in the name of that politics. So today, that remains the central credo for us that Gandhi, if we have to follow, we have to try to remove the misconceptions which have proliferated against the Muslim community, which are coming up against the Christian community because. These misconceptions, they form the base for hatred, hate. And this hate, which as Sardar Patel pointed out, led to the murder of Mahatma Gandhi. That hate is a central pulling back point for today's society. Thank, this you, hate, very much. Thank you very much. Now, I, we have maybe two, three minutes. So I would, I would request you, I would, so what would be your actually concluding comments? My concluding, com my concluding comments will be that now this uh, struggle for a just and secular society has to be multi-layered. At one level, it is a political level that we ensure that communal parties don't come to power. At second level, we must ensure that all the social groups committed to secularism and democracy, they try to reach out to the community and try to see that the political goal is achieved. And number three, at community level, at community level, it is very important that we reach out with a message where misconceptions are uh, busted. Four wives, 20 children, temples were destroyed, Islam was imposed by force, Muslims are terrorists and all that. And that love jihad, corona jihad, all that has to be neutralized. And amity, communal harmony has to be cultivated on the lines of Mahatma Gandhi. Thank you very much, Ram Puniyazi. Thank you very much. We'll get back to you again whenever there is some sure. urgent issues. We'll come back to you. We shall have more discussion with you. Thank you very much for participating in this. Thanks and always welcome.